Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Friends, uh, let us try to take uh, further the discussion on the peasant movement in India. And I think uh, we had tried to cover up certain peasant movements that we tried to initiate earlier. We had spoken about uh, the Tebhaga movement, we have spoken about the Telangana movement. I think uh, both of them were uh, in the different areas. Basically, we try to speak about uh, that. Uh, Telangana which was basically in the Hyderabad region and we try to see Tebhaga which was in Bengal. So, I think uh, we had tried to cover up the different movements uh, which has been there at different period of time and uh, most of the movements have been at the various phases of development. Uh, we try to see that uh, what were the various undercurrents, uh, what was the social setting uh, which has been there. We also try to see that uh, what are the conditions uh, which has made the movement uh, to germinate. And also we have seen that what are the circumstances uh, which has made the movement to come to a specific shape. And then we have also tried to find out uh, through the various studies that what had led to the decline of the movement. I think uh, friends when we try to speak about uh, any movement, uh, we try to see that uh, any movement can be uh, seen into various phases like uh, first of course is uh, the phase of emergence uh, which we try to see that how it starts and uh, that way if you try to see uh, every movement has a specific uh, beginning. Uh, then it has the phase of expansion which we try to see in terms of uh, its intensity and then we try to see that every movement have its decline uh, which is seen as the downfall uh, of the movement. So, I think uh, any uh, movement whatsoever we try to see either it is the Telangana or Tebhaga, we try to see that uh, what has made the movement to come into picture and what has led to the decline. So, in the similar lines now we are going to take up another important uh, movement as a case study and uh, this is basically chapter 9, 9th uh, which is focusing upon uh, the specific movement which is the Mofla rebellion. Uh, so, we are basically dealing with the Mofla rebellion uh, which is seen as a specific movement uh, which tries to uncover uh, another debate about uh, the various present movements that we had. Uh, we will try to see that uh, in this Mofla movement which is basically concentrating around the Malabar area, uh, it will try to explain the Malabar agricultural system and the role of British, British administrators and also we try to see that the Muslim invasion of the Malabar uh, has led to the widespread atrocities on the Hindu population. So, here also we try to see that uh, it is basically the movement which involves the Hindu and the Muslim population. A new system of land revenue was on the basis of the actual produce from the land. Thus, in 1921 uh, the aim of uh, this movement was basically uh, against the Janmi system and to establish an Islamic nation in Malabar. The British administrators has referred to it as an outbreak, as an Mofla outrage and this particular unit 9th is basically expressing the genesis, social conditions and outcome of the Mofla rebellion. So, friends uh, uh, let us try to see that uh, what has made the movement to creep up, uh, what were the conditionality which has made the things uh, more ripe and then also we try to see that what has led to the downfall of this movement. Uh, so, basically our concern will be more towards the changing social structure which is basically making the movement to come into shape. We will try to speak about the revolt by Mofla peasantry that is going to be an important issue because uh, that virtually has led to the sharpening of the movements. And then 
we'll try to see as uh, the decline of the movement in terms of the downfall of the mofla movement i think uh, these are important things uh, that we have to see and uh, the main thrust of this unit is basically in identifying the changing agrarian structure of malabar and we also have to see uh, the revolt which has been done by the mofla peasantry and we try to also identify what is the possible outcome of this movement uh, that is going to be an important issue. So, to begin with uh, let us try to speak about uh, in detail uh, what is the background that has made the mofla to come up into a specific shape. Uh, the moflas of Malabar in the southern India presents a fascinating case study. A series of mofla uprising against both the Hindus landlords and the British occurred throughout the 19th century and culminating finally in the greatest uh, sustained armed revolt to break out in Malabar in the first quarter of the century. The chapter focuses mainly on the interaction of agrarian, religious and the political development and the Mofla response to them between the uh, period of 1835 to 1921. I think this is the uh, timeline in which we can locate the Mofla in terms of its intensity in order to explain the social structure, structure and those changes with, within which we try to see the Mofla rebellion which has come into prominence. I think uh, this period speaks about uh, the range of activities which has been undertaken uh, in the Mofla rebellion. Uh, nowhere in India uh, having the foreign trading, the commercial and the religious interests interacted within the indigenous socio-economic and the political institutions uh, than that have been in Malabar. So, I think uh, somewhere there was a uniqueness of uh, Malabar uh, in terms of having the foreign trading and also we have the commercial and the religious interest both of them were there. The history of the Arab trading contacts with the Malayali society dates back to the 9th century. The local Hindu chieftains in this coastal region needed the support of the wealthy and enterprising Arab traders and hence granted them the liberal concession in, the, in their trade and business. Subsequently, those Arab traders who settled in Malabar married the local women, mostly the Nayars and Tiyars or Tiyans and their descendants were basically the mixed race which were called as the Mofla or Mapilas. And from here only we try to see that, that the nomenclature of Mofla has come into existence. Thereafter, the Mofla population increased steadily and we try to see that the traders has purchased the large number of children from the lower caste Hindus and other subordinate groups in order to uh, men their knaves. A practice not only permitted but openly enjoyed by Zamorians, Rajas in Malabar. Occasionally, those Tiyar's women who violated the rigid sexual taboos were sold to the Moflas. Uh, for whom each new proselytization was a welcoming addition despite the fact that upper caste Hindus treated them as the outcast. So, I think uh, somewhere we try to see that uh, the movement has a social bearing in terms of uh, uh, the conversion, uh, religious conversion which was been quite visible. Now, let us try to see that what is the uh, uh, social structure which was prevailing and how it has changed through time. So, what is the social structure let us try to understand. that conversion uh, which was opened up as an avenue of social mobility for the Cherumars who being at the bottom of the social hierarchy in the Malabar and being attached to the land as a slave labor had suffered the oppression from the powerful land owning caste particularly the Namudri Brahmins for the centuries. So, it is basically the sort of atrocities which has been uh, created by the Namudri Brahmins against the uh, lower caste. Uh, who were acting as the slaves that is the Cher uh, Cherumars and the Cherumars slaves were sold, mortgaged or hired along with the land. So, by conversion to Islam they could not only free themselves from the bondages but also uh, rise in the social scale without any reprisal from the caste Hindu population. So, I think somewhere we try to see that uh, religious conversion was seen as a site of emancipation. Uh, for the lower caste Hindus and they wanted by converting into Islam 
uh, they were basically trying to be move away from uh, the caste Hindu population in terms of the atrocity which has been created historically. So, as converts uh, they merited both the sympathy and protection of the well organized Moflas whose ranks they joined. So, the conversion into Moflas was seen as a, a sort of a motivation uh, and also a sort of an encouragement uh, because that was seen as uh, the way out for moving away from the atrocities uh, which has been uh, faced by uh, these people through history. So, the force conversion was practically unknown before the arrival of the Mysorean con conqueror and proselytizing in general seems to have progressed through the economic incentives and persuasion. The Arab monopoly of the trade and their political influence were both endangered when the Portuguese arrived in Malabar at the end of the 15th century. So, till 19, 9th century we try to see that uh, Arab monopoly has been there, but later on we try to see that Portuguese has arrived, later on the Dutch, English and the French also joined the contest for supremacy in the Malabar export trade. The historical details of their mercantiles and power rivalry are documented elsewhere and need to uh, be repeated here also. In the coastal towns, the moflas were actually usually employed as petty traders and merchants, but a large proportion of those in the interior had taken to agriculture. They also emulated the martial uh, marital traditions of Nayars and acquired a reputation as uh, warriors. So, we try to see that uh, uh, they were also seen as the warriors. Most of the moflas, however, lived in the areas governed by the Hindu chieftains. The Arikal Raja of Kannur was the only Muslim chieftain who had a political power to recon with the northern Malabar. His troops consisted mostly of the moflas. Occasionally, the moflas were recruited as soldiers by the French and the English as well as, but this may uh, was in no sense a political alignment. It was not until the Hyder Ali, the Mysore ruler who invaded Malabar in the 1760 that the Mofla aligned themselves politically with an external power. But before that, it was basically seen as a apolitical activity. During these invasions, the Namudri Brahmins fled in fear and sought asylum in the state of Travancore, where the ruler were Kshatriyas, uh, that is the warrior caste Hindus, and while the Nayar chieftains either followed the suit or surrendered to the conqueror or took refuge in the jungles to continue the struggle. Those who attempted to resist and recapture their territories were brutally suppressed by Mysoreans. So, in the first decade of the British rule in Malabar, one of the questions that caused the new authorities and anxiety concerned the land owning rights of the different classes. The Nayars and the Namudris were now returning and re-establishing themselves, but during their absence many Moflas had, uh, had taken possession of the land and they had previously held with them. The new government has a difficult time reconciling the conflict uh, claims to the land of Nayars and Moflas. So, somewhere we try to see that uh, this situation of ambiguity over the control over the land was uh, uh, seen as uh, a, a conditionality of uh, discontent and particularly in checking the uh, widespread of the Mofla banditry. The customary land rights of various classes has been disturbed during the short lived Mysorean rule and the British administrators attempted to restore them in the course of their first land settlement. Therefore, the way that the British understood the various different kinds of land tenure and defined the enfo and enforced them should provide us with certain clue as to the cause of Mofla rising. Uh, that occurred throughout the 19th century culminating in the rebellion of 1921. So, virtually we try to see that uh, a certain amount of uh, issues with regard to the land tenure in terms of uh, the control over the land uh, that was one of the burning issue uh, which has basically led to the Mofla uprising and that is why we are trying to consider it as a form of a peasant uh, uh, revolt. Uh, in the Malabar, the economic hierarchy of rights correspond perfectly with the several tied social structure. Uh, like we have Namudri Brahmins at the top and Cherumars 
pulayas and parayas as at the bottom of the ladder. Although the exact nature of the Namudri superior rights in land was rather unclear until the first British settlement, it is nevertheless true that members of the priestly caste had held large estate for centuries. The ancient land tenure system in Malabar was somewhat similar to the feudal system of tenures in the medieval Europe. The ruling king made grants of land to Namudri Brahmins for the management of temples and other institutions they looked after and also the Rajas and the chieftains who were basically the Nayars and who had a military obligations to the king to protect his territory with their retainers. So, the fundamental idea in the Malabar land system does seem to be protection and supervision rather than ownership in the sense of modern use. So, those who held land, they were basically called as the Janmis, uh, that is those having the birthright. Uh, let it out to others for cultivation, retaining only a small portion as the personal farm to be cultivated by the bonded slaves. So, the land grants were hereditary and implied the customary sharing of the produce between the Janmis and those other classes uh, below him which included the Kanamdars or Kanakaran, the Verupattam and the agricultural laborers. So, the Kanam was a tenure whereby the tenant offered a sum to a Janmi either as a security or as an advance rent in return for the land leased out for a specified period. This was more or less the equivalent as mortgaging the land. Now, Kanamdars either sublet the land to the Veru Pattamdars for the actual cultivators or hired laborers or to cultivate it under their own management. Only a few of them cultivated land with family labor. So, most of the Kanamdars came from the educated middle class and held the bureaucratic positions. Having invested the money in securing Kanam tenure, their mortgages has come to occupy the middleman position in the agrarian social structure. So, they were basically acting as the middleman with regard to the land system. It was during the Mysorean invasion that the agrarian structure of Malabar has disturbed for the first time. The Mysorean rule under uh, introduced a land tax which encroached on the customary share of Janmis and the Kanamdars, but left the share of Virumdars uh, who were basically the actual cultivators intact. Since many Brahmins and Nayars had fled and lands were actually in the positions of Kanamdars, now mostly was with the Moflas. Therefore, in all probability, it was the Mofla Kanamdars and that the Mysore revenue officials made through the first settlement. Those who rebelled or resisted were hanged. In this respect, as has already been mentioned, the Mysorean did not spare even the co-religious also. So, after taking a control of Malabar in 1792, the British government appointed a joint commission to inquire into the nature of Malabar land tenure uh, because the land tenure system has been uh, disrupted or sometimes the ambiguity has been there. So, the commission began its work in the midst of the near hierarchy. The Brahmins and the Nayars who had uh, fled were now returning and trying to reinstate themselves under the British protection. The claims and the counterclaims regarding the control of land has created a chaotic situation while the religious persecution by the Mysorean has totally upset the hitherto friendly relation between the Brahmins, the Nayars and the Moflas. It was therefore the urgent need to settle the land questions in Malabar that drove the first joint commissioner to recognize the Janmis rather harshly as an absolute proprietary rights in the land and to declare the Kanamdars and Veru Pattamdars the tenants of the Janmis. It was basically seen as the leaseholders liable to be evicted at expiry of the lease. So, to a degree the British recognition of the Janmis right as an absolute propri proprietary right may be seen as a part of general tendency to relate the kind of property rights with which the English administrators were familiar at home. Secondly, the commissioner used the system of land settlement in Mysore as their point of reference with the result that the revenue rates they fixed were very high. 
in 1800 for example the revenue burden amounts to 35 to 40 percent of the gross produce thirdly the government relied on the recently restored hindu rajas and the chieftains for the collection of revenue and this resulted in unequal assessment mofla cultivators being rated more heavily than the hindus this occasioned the several outbreak of violence between the moflas and nayars uh, which were suppressed by the britishers so it is important to note that the recognition of janmi as an absolute owner or the lord of soil formed the lasting basis of the british land policy in malabar and throughout the 19th century the british administrative and the judicial institutions thus worked directly to restore the landed aristocracy of the namudri janmis and nayars so we try to find out that the preservation of class of landlord was vital to the british policy of securing the allies although they professed the aim of the policy of restoration uh, which was been stated to be attainment of the highest objective of the good government and the future improvement of the people corruption was rife in the ranks of the revenue staff who made a common cause with the landlords tempered with the deeds and contract so as to be best serve the landlords interest and by such means also made their own fortunes with newly established law courts janmis were able to extort more renewal fees and rent from the lease holders whom they simply threatened with legal evictions if they were refused to pay by such means ease superior right holders could extract a large share than previously from the old uh, from the one immediately below him in the chain of sub infidification and the worst sufferers of all were the veru pattamdars and the landless laborers whether the mofla or the hindus now let us try to see the mofla rebellion which actually took place in malabar in 1921 and i think uh, that may be the uh, the grounding through which we can really understand that how or uh, what has made the mofla rebellion to happen uh, in a specific fashion the mofla peasant movement was engineered in august 1921 among the peasants of malabar district in kerala the first important thing is that the mofla tenants were muslims and they initiated against the hindu landlord and the british government so it was basically a tussle between the re religion uh, between the hindus and the muslims their grievances were related to the lack of any secure security of tenure renewal fees high rent and other oppressive landed uh, landlord ex exaction in the 19th century as well there has been the case of mofla resistance to landlords operation but what erupted in 1921 was a different scale altogether actually the freedom movement covered a span of long decade beginning from 1835 to 1947 the social and the economic background of the mofla has been quite heterogeneous the elites among the moflas earned their livelihood by working as a petty traders and merchants however the masses of mofla earned their livelihood by working as small agriculturists they were the tenants of the big landlords who happened to be the high caste hindus though the moflas were poor they imitated the traditional ways of nayars and acquired the reputation of warriors uh, there was British ruler in uh, Malabar. The officials, in collaboration with Hindu landlords, exploited the moflas and oppressed them to the greater length. So, we try to say that the mofla agitation of 1921 was preceded by several movements between 1835 to 1921. And D. N. Dhanagre has elaborated the series of mofla movement which took place before the major mofla movement of 1921. He traces the history of Mofla movement uh, according to uh, the important sources. He says that uh, significantly as soon as the Janmi landlords backed by the police, the law courts and the revenue officials tightened their grip on the subordinate classes, the Mofla peasantry in its turn stated, uh, started to revolt against the oppressors. The first such outbreak occurred in 1836 and thereafter between 1836 to 1854 that 22 similar uprisings has occurred of which uh, in 1841 and another in 1849 were quite serious 
in general the outbreak followed a similar patterns of uh, understanding almost invariably it involves a group of uh, mufla youths attacking a brahmin janmis and uh, anaya officials or janmi servants sometimes it also involved the burning or defilement of the temples and occasionally the burning or looting of the landlord's house so i think uh, the violence also was involved in terms of destruction of the properties uh, which has been seen we also tried to find out that uh, it was basically having a religious color also many rebel had some sort of family titles uh, with the leader uh, athan kurikal whose ancestors were associated with the past mofla rebellion athan was angry about the way the large number of evictions done by hindu landlord and deprived the mofla peasant and the way the government encroached the inams ya waqfs that is the tax free land and thus the manjari revolt was stemmed as a sheer fanatism uh, which was having a religious belief later on in 1852 the government of madras appointed a commissioner to inquire into the case of mofla disturbance but they also favored the hindu landlords and after this the de- deadline was fixed for mofla to surrender the arms in 1855 the kanoli, kanoli who was the dm of malabar uh, he was uh, having a tragic death and which led to the further intensification of the repression his killers were captured and publicly hanged the bodies were burned instead of burying them uh, as per the islamic practices and the ashes of uh, these people were collected and buried within the walls of the jail so i think uh, somewhere we try to see that uh, uh, it is a sort of intensification of uh, the terror uh, that uh, if someone who is trying to uh, go against the law uh, will be treated uh, very harshly and uh, to an extent that even they will not be allowed to be having uh, the death as per the religious practices as we have seen the case so the mofla community has to adopt the new conditions of repression the formulation of the new role of mosque and madrasa uh, has been there uh, proselytization to strengthen the mofla numbers uh, was been carried forward because they wanted to have more and more moflas under them so that they can have uh, regain their strength which they earlier had so it reinforced the religious identity of mofla but could not change their material conditions because if you try to see the economic prosperity of mofla it has gradually declined and we try to see that uh, uh, the attempts for enhancement of the number or certain uh, initiative which has been taken up by athan kurikal followers uh, they could not bring back the glory of the moflas in 1875 the government has appointed a uh, william logan as the dm of malabar i think uh, uh, this is where we have to see that how uh, we try to speak about uh, that uh, moflas uh, which were basically trying to have uh, an important understanding and in 1885 his committee accelerated the tenure system and this has led to the further rebellion in 1896 uh, killing the hindu landlords i think uh, if we have to speak about uh, these particular issues uh, we try to find out that uh, the sort of uh, mofla rebellion was basically seen as an outcome of uh, uh, certain religious uh, what you can say color especially we try to see that uh, initially uh, there was some favor which was been given to the uh, so called uh, uh, what you can say the uh, past uh, uh, inheritors of the land especially we try to speak about the moflas uh, who had been uh, safeguarded by basically the uh, initial rule but when we try to see the support of british we try to find out that uh, the britishers uh, they sometimes uh, try to support uh, the the hindu landlords and that is where we try to see uh, that uh, there was a, a certain amount of distress which has been there and virtually we try to see that uh, uh, these religious colors has basically uh, shaped the sort of mofla rebellion uh, we try to see that uh, many arrangements have been made especially we try to speak about uh, that how uh, we have uh, many different uh, uh, shades which has been given we try to speak about uh, how the different uh, higher caste uh, uh, populations uh, which were basically the hindu 
uh, the Hindu population uh, who were basically seen as the Namudri Brahmins, uh, they had the supremacy and the Cherumars who were basically the lower caste Hindus, uh, they were being exploited <coughs> uh, in the old arrangements and uh, how the Cherumars were being motivated to switch off from the Hindu religion to the uh, Muslim religion uh, in terms of uh, having certain amount of uh, escape from the atrocities uh, which they were facing. So, virtually we try to find out that uh, these Cherumars when they were converted into uh, Islam and we try to see that uh, they form the part and parcel of uh, the Mofla and uh, these Moflas uh, uh, which were basically having a certain amount of uh, uh, what you can say uh, <coughs> benefits uh, when the Arab monopoly was there. So, during the Arabic uh, 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 time when the Arabs were having the monopoly in terms of trade and political influence, uh, they were basically having the upper hand and Moflas were been blindly supported even the proselytizations, uh, the religious conversions have been there uh, which has been safeguarded by the Arabs and uh, the all possibilities of the favors were been given to the Muslim population. And uh, even the land uh, were been granted to them in terms of uh, the benefits and we try to see that uh, during this particular period uh, there was uh, bad arrangements which has been made for the uh, Hindu uh, uh, rulers basically uh, even the control over the land was been taken away and it was been basically given to the Moflas. But the things have changed when we try to see that uh, the advent of uh, the other uh, uh, what you can say trading uh, institutions have come into the picture especially the advent of Portuguese uh, uh, in Malabar and then we have the Dutch and the English uh, who has gradually joined and also we try to see that uh, uh, the sort of an arrangements which have been uh, uh, perpetuating in the Malabar region uh, and how the uh, Moflas were basically been benefited. And uh, we try to see that uh, the Nayars uh, who were been having a good reputation in terms of the martial traditions, uh, uh, they were not basically given the upper hand uh, in terms of a support. But virtually we try to see that uh, as the British rule in the Malabar has uh, come into prominence, the Nayars and the uh, Namudris, they were started returning and re-establishing themselves. And uh, uh, during this uh, uh, initial period uh, when the uh, Moflas were given the upper hand, I think uh, most of the land rights were given to them directly or indirectly. And uh, once the British rule has came back, uh, uh, came in Malabar, they try to uh, really try to restructure the land arrangements and uh, through the various committees they try to set up certain arrangements whereby the Hindu chieftains uh, that is the Nayars and the Namudris, uh, they could gain the uh, benefits uh, which they had retained earlier. And uh, the Moflas uh, who had the possession of the lands, uh, who had previously having the control over the lands uh, under the Arab rulers, now it has to be uh, taken over and now it has to be given to the Nayars. And uh, even we try to see that uh, certain amount of Mofla banditry also has been uh, promoted and the customary land rights of various classes has been disturbed uh, when the Mysore rule has been advented. So, during the Mysore rule, I think uh, certain amount of land grab initiatives have been uh, taken up and Mofla banditry were trying to capture the lands of the Hindu chieftains, basically the Nayars. Uh, but however, uh, when the things have changed back again and we try to see that uh, again when there is an advent of uh, the British rule, uh, we try to speak about that uh, the arrangements have been restructured again. Uh, the ruling king uh, made grants to the land to the Namudri Brahmins for the management of temples and the Raja and the chieftains, mostly the Nayars, they had been given the military obligations uh, to the king to protect the territory. So, I think it is again uh, <coughs> uh, what you can say trying to see uh, the sort of churning which has taken place. So, it is uh, uh, the whole movement has to be seen in terms of having uh, wave arrangements whereby there is a rise of the Moflas and then there is a downfall of the Moflas in terms of uh, their control over the land. Similarly, when we try to speak about the Hindu chieftains, especially the Nayars and the Mudri Brahmins, we try to see that Namudri Brahmins uh, and the Nayars 
they had a uh, well of positions uh, uh, initially and gradually through time it has declined and again uh, they try to revive. So, I think uh, lots of ups and downs are there, but ultimately because of uh, these uh, uh, what you can say initiatives which have been there uh, either at the end of the Arab traders or the British uh, uh, traders in that sense and also uh, with the gradual advent of uh, uh, the in between rule uh, by the Tipu Sultan. We try to see that uh, certain amount of uh, arrangement has been distorted especially the control and the uh, land rights they have been highly disturbed and we can say that uh, because of these things uh, what has happened of course is that uh, lot many atrocities has taken place even the communal relationships which has been there between the Hindus and the Muslims that has been sharpened and it has also led to certain amount of banditries uh, which has been done by the Moflas who tried to grab the land of the upper caste Hindus and that is where we try to see that whole disturbance has taken place. Uh, we also try to see that uh, uh, the lands uh, which were basically given uh, to the Janmis uh, who has been seen as having the <coughs> real control over the lands. So, the Janmi uh, who were basically called as uh, having the land by birthright. Now, they had to change uh, the color and we try to see that uh, the sort of uh, uh, con containment of uh, the cultivation rights in terms of small portion of land. So, the Janmis uh, who were seen as uh, <coughs> the important class uh, in terms of in, uh, people who were basically the Kanamdars and the Varu Patamdars and also we have the agricultural laborers. So, uh, the tenure system basically the Janmi relations in that sense has been disturbed and Kanams was a tenure whereby the tenants offered a sum to the Janmi. So, I think uh, somewhere we try to see that uh, the arrangements which have been there uh, between the different caste groups also has changed and we try to see that uh, uh, the, the issue of uh, Kanamdars uh, in terms of uh, uh, <coughs> giving uh, certain land to the Virumpatadars for actual cultivations in terms of hired labors to cultivate their own management. So, I think uh, these are the arrangements which have been there. Um, although they were not the permanent structures, but we try to see that it has basically led to certain amount of distortion and the sort of exploitation uh, which has been there. And uh, especially when we try to see that during the Mysore invasion, uh, how the agrarian structure of the Malabar has been disturbed, uh, basically we try to see that uh, the customary shares of the Janmis and the Kanamdars uh, that was basically been disturbed. And, uh, uh, we try to see that uh, the Brahmins and Nayars virtually they have to leave the land and uh, uh, the lands were actually uh, in the positions of the Kanamdars who were basically the cultivators and most of them were the Moflas. So, virtually the land rights were given to the Moflas back. So, I think uh, these sort of uh, uh, rivalries which has been there uh, historically uh, either it is the British invasion or it is the Mysore invasion or it is sometimes seen as the Arab invasions, all these things has led to uh, the whole distortion of the agrarian relations. And we try to see that uh, uh, suddenly the people who have been the landlords has to uh, uh, just uh, give off their land and those who are basically having the control over the land in terms of cultivations, they have become uh, the real landlords and gradually when the things have changed, so the landlord has become uh, back to uh, the tenancy uh, in terms of uh, the uh, tenants of that land. So, I think these arrangements were uh, making the things uh, more different and uh, various arrangements has been made by the various uh, ruler, especially the British government who tried to uh, bring back the glory of uh, uh, putting the Malabar land tenure straight. I think uh, and for that they have appointed the various commissions and uh, somewhere uh, the British government had tried to favor uh, the Hindu landlords, Hindu chieftains who are basically serving their armies and that is how they tried to, to, giving, uh, to give back a certain amount of control to the Brahmins and the Nayars uh, who had fled uh, away. So, uh, we try to see that uh, these supports or these arrangements have somewhere led to certain amount of changes uh, within the existing structure. And uh, uh, 
uh, ultimately we try to see that uh, Mofla rebellion has to be seen in terms of uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, outburst uh, which is coming out because the so called uh, ruler uh, has been thrown off or has been changed and then suddenly uh, there is certain amount of land grass which has been there by uh, sometimes the Hindu chieftains or sometimes it has been done by the Moflas. But on all possibilities and probabilities it is found that uh, uh, the sort of uh, recognition of Janmis as an absolute owner as the lord of the soil at certain period of time during the British land policy uh, that has happened and uh, all favours were given to the Hindu landlords. But at the same time we also find out that the Moflas has also had uh, the high level of motivation for acquiring the land. So, virtually we try to see that uh, these arrangements had made the things uh, more, more chaotic and uh, that is how we try to see a shift which has taken place. I think uh, when we try to see the Mofla rebellion uh, which started in 1921 and uh, how it has spread uh, in the Malabar districts in Kerala. Uh, that has gained the attention of many historians uh, and social scientists. Uh, basically, we try to see that uh, 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 it was basically the Muslims who had agitated against the Hindu landlords and the British government. So, uh, this Mofla rebellion is basically seen as uh, uh, the Muslim uh, landlords who were basically fighting against the Hindu landlords and the British government uh, who were tied together. And this is where we try to see that the land or uh, lack of uh, any security of tenure, I think that was one important issue. And then the high rents uh, and the oppressive landlord execution, I think uh, were certain important issues which uh, uh, Mofla resistance was trying to overcome. And uh, in order to do that, I think uh, somewhere the initiatives have been there uh, which has taken the shape of uh, violence including the burning of the houses of the landlords or sometimes even trying to disturb the religious institutions uh, of the upper caste Hindus. And that is how we try to see that uh, the things have been shifted. And we try to find out that uh, uh, somewhere uh, we have uh, the bearing of uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, rulers like uh, Athan Kurikal uh, who has uh, played a prominent role with regard to bringing the Mofla rebellion into the picture. And we try to see that uh, how the uh, British governments they try to support the Hindu landlords and deprive the Mofla peasants. Uh, so, uh, that has been highly questioned by uh, the followers of Athan Kurikal. And uh, we try to see that uh, uh, when there was uh, Lord Colonelli who was uh, the DM of Malabar has been uh, uh, has the tragic death uh, virtually has led to a certain amount of intensification of uh, uh, what you can say the disturbances uh, between the Mofla uh, Muslim rulers uh, and the cap and also the Hindu uh, chieftains. And I think uh, this is where we try to see even when the uh, William Logan as the DM of Malabar he was trying to uh, make certain reforms in terms of uh, uh, bringing about uh, some favor to the uh, Hindu landlords. Uh, but uh, uh, the rebellion was gone to such an extent that uh, many Hindu landlords uh, were been killed by the Moflas and that is what made this uh, movement more violent. So, virtually we try to see that uh, the so called uh, uh, what you can say uh, <coughs> effect which we can see after the killing of William Logan not the killing of the Hindu landlords uh, has been seen and ultimately there is a gross neglect of the tenurial security and the deterioration of the landlord tenant uh, relationships has been there. And there is also the political alienation of poor peasantry uh, which were basically seen as a condition of the outbreak of the 1921 Mofla rebellion. Along with this uh, were the tenancy movement and also the Khilafat and the non-cooperation movement of the Indian National Congress. And uh, that is where we try to see uh, that uh, this movement uh, has been uh, having certain amount of uh, prominence at the national map uh, because it has its association with the uh, Khilafat movement and somewhere it has been heading, having certain support from the Indian National Congress. Uh, the epicenter of uh, the Mofla rebellion uh, in terms of a tenancy movement was in Calicut and the Kanamdars 
uh, who boycotted the landlord by refusing to give the rent uh, which is expected from the land. The first Malabar Tenant Association was formed in 1916. So, basically we try to see that uh, it was a hardcore resistance uh, which has been registered by the tenant. They had formed an tenant association and between 1916 to 1920, we try to see that the leaders of the Kanamdar tenant captured the control over the Malabar Congress. So, I think uh, somewhere we try to see that uh, there is certain uh, intervention of the political affairs also and we try to see even the national leaders like uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Shaukat Ali, Maulana Azad, they have also visited the Malabar to promote the campaign. So, virtually we try to see that uh, the Kanamdar tenants uh, had shown uh, the high range of uh, uh, what you can say uh, change especially uh, they could bring back the uh, sort of a, a policy whereby the tenancy movement has become national and we try to see that between 1916 to 1920. Uh, the leader has uh, the Kanamdar uh, tenants has basically tried to give a new color uh, to this uh, Mofla rebellion. And in April 1921, uh, the Majlis Ul Ulema, that is the National Muslim Organizations, in conference at Erode, had called upon the Mofla masses to launch a jihad. So, I think uh, this is where we try to see that uh, Mofla masses are trying to. Uh, give a new color to the movement in terms of a religious movement and they wanted to launch it is in terms of a jihad. And uh, however, uh, we try to see that uh, by the end of the December 1923, the Mofla rebellion has been completely suppressed. And I think uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, we basically try to see that uh, uh, the national uh, character of this movement to some extent also has the downfall like uh, the Khilafat movement uh, which has been quite vibrant, uh, but somewhere uh, Mahatma Gandhi also uh, thought of that uh, this Khilafat movement uh, if it goes uh, higher then sometimes the communal color can also be given at the national level. And so, the Khilafat movement has not been uh, taken up very seriously and was not been promoted at the national level. So, the same uh, issue has happened here whereby the Mofla. Uh, who had been supported by the Khilafat movement, uh, but gradually we try to see a gradual decline. It is basically the shrinking of or sometimes we try to find out that uh, the National Congress also did not uh, initially they supported the Mofla rebellion, but uh, gradually they try to indirectly withdraw uh, the support because they try to feel that it is going to be uh, having the communal appeal. And that is how we try to see that there is a gradual decline which has happened uh, with regard to the Mofla uh, rebellion. And we can say that uh, the Mofla movement of 1921 was altogether different. Uh, first, it has erupted among the Muslim peasants against the Hindu landlord. So, that was the first stage uh, that we try to see. And then uh, secondly, we try to see it was characterized by certain amount of violence. Basically, it involves the killings of the Hindu landlords. Sometimes it is been seen as capturing or destroying the properties of the uh, Hindu chieftains. So, a uh, certain amount of violence was involved and uh, Gandhi as uh, the promoter of non-violence uh, did not want it that uh, it should happen. And thirdly, the movement as the history goes fell into the trap of the Hindu Muslim riots. And I think uh, this is where we try to see that any movement if it is uh, trying to have the Hindu Muslim right. So, the appeal for the landlordism or the land rights in terms of the land reforms or in terms of bringing about the tenancy reforms, they are going to be away. Uh, because uh, uh, nobody will try to support uh, if something is going on the communal lines. And during this period, the Khilafat movement as I shared uh, is a movement that raised from the attainment of freedom for the Muslims. And I think uh, when we try to see that uh, uh, Khilafat movement showed uh, much emphasis towards this movement. Uh, uh, the National Congress tried to withdraw uh, gradually and this is where we try to see the downfall of the Mofla rebellion had started. Uh, some of the important causes of Mofla peasant movements uh, which we can uh, narrate are 
basically we try to see that uh, any analysis of the present movement of Mofla uh, should uh, take into account that the Moflas were Muslim peasants. Their landlords were called the Janmis uh, who were basically the Hindus and the relations of between the Janmis and the Moflas were historically quite unfriendly. In other words, the relations were both economically and religiously antagonistic and in 1835 the Hindu landlords suppressed the Mofla tenants. So, we try to see that uh, uh, the basic cause of Mofla agitation was operation against the Janmis. So, it was basically the Janmis, uh, uh, the relationship between the Janmis and the Moflas uh, which was going to be a uh, very important cause for bringing about uh, the Mofla rebellion. Uh, another important issue is that the land tenure system in Malabar was quite unfavorable to the Mofla tenants. Uh, as we have said that uh, the Mofla tenancy has been fluctuating according to the rule and sometimes we try to see that during Arab time, uh, Arab rule it was very ripe, but when we try to see during the British rule, uh, suddenly there was a, a sharp decline. So, we try to see that there are different shades of Mofla tenancy uh, which has happened. There was a total insecurity of the tenure uh, to the Moflas if you say and they could be ejected from their land uh, without any appropriate notice. So, I think uh, these are certain things uh, which has happened. Then we also try to see that the immediate cause of Mofla agitation was the renewal of the fees at the exorbitant rate fixed by the Janmis and this was unbearable for the Moflas in a true sense we try to see that execution practiced by the Janmis were of very high order and more often we try to see that Moflas were discriminated against the Hindu tenants. So, there are two uh, different things uh, uh, which goes simultaneously. Uh, we try to see that uh, the land relations uh, uh, which has not been uh, uh, having a specific uh, subject, uh, sometimes there is a fluctuation with regard to the ownership and we try to see that uh, the Hindu uh, tenants have been dif treated differently, uh, however, the Muslim tenants have been uh, treated differently. So, I think uh, these are certain things which has created more unrest uh, with regard to the movement and the course of event that has led to the Mofla movement uh, can be seen uh, in a specific sense that the first impetus of the Mofla resistance uh, which is started against the landlord, it has came from the Malabar district congress committee which was held at uh, Majeri in April 1920. And we try to see that uh, this conference supported the tenants cause and demanded the legislation to regulate the landlord tenant relationships. And we also try to see uh, following the uh, Majeri conference of 1920 that the Mofla tenants uh, formed an association uh, which had its branches in the whole of Kerala and this has brought the Mofla tenants under one organization. So, we try to find out that uh, the motivating factors for the 1921 Mofla agitation was also the Khilafat movement which has constituted a wider part of national struggle for independence and this movement developed its roots in Malabar also. So, the Moflas has took an active part in the Khilafat movement uh, at the national level. Actually, in practice the meeting of Moflas and the Khilafat could have hardly be separated. So, we can see that uh, uh, there were certain uh, protection and support which has been there uh, from the leadership of Khilafat movement to the Mofla <coughs> movement and the bonds between the Khilafat movement and the Mofla tenants became so much mixed that the government issued prohibitory notices on all Khilafat meetings on the 5th February 1921 and this has displeased the Moflas and ended up with the agitation of the Mofla peasantry. So, somewhere we try to see that uh, uh, Mofla peasantry uh, whose concern was not only for the land rights, but their concern was also to have uh, an upper hand for the uh, Muslim uh, peasantry. Uh, that was another important thing which was coming up and we try to see that uh, this has basically mismatched certain amount of uh, relationship between uh, the two uh, <coughs> units. Uh, we also try to see that the British government was weakened uh, uh, with the result of the first world war and it was not in a position to take strong military action against the Moflas uh, <coughs> and we try to see uh, that Moflas began to exhibit 
increasingly signs of uh, turbulence and defiance of authority. The final break came when the district magistrate of Arnard Kaluka uh, on August 1921 has raided the mosque of uh, <coughs> Turanga Gadi to arrest Ali uh, Musailer was a Khilafat leader and he, he was highly respected priest uh, uh, in that mosque and the people were quite uh, peaceful but the police has opened the fire on the unarmed crowd and this has led to a lot of killing and a clash ensured that government offices were destroyed, the records were burned and the treasury, treasury was looted. So, the rebellion soon spread into the Arnard, Veluvadad and Punani Talukas uh, and all these were the important uh, uh, Moflas stronghold in terms of population and in terms of uh, their uh, <coughs> political setting. We also try to see that the agitations uh, were targeted uh, which were been targeted uh, which has been targeted by the Mofla attacks were the unpopular Janmis. They were basically the Hindus, police stations, treasuries and the offices and the British planters. Uh, the Hindu landlords who were uh, lenient to the relations with the Moflas were uh, spared by the later. Uh, it is also been seen interestingly the Mofla rebellion uh, rebels travelled several miles through the territory uh, populated by the Hindus and attacked only the landlords. So, this has gave, given a communal flavour to the present agitation and as a matter of fact the Malabar people in general lost all the sympathy with the Moflas. Uh, especially we try to see the communalization of the present agitation was suicidal to the Mofla. So, commenting on this new aspect of Mofla agitation, uh, the historian Vipin Chandra has said that the communalization of the rebellion com completed the isolation of Moflas uh, from the nation and from the region. Uh, the British repression did not rest and by December 19, 1921 all the resistance has come to a stop. So, the toll was heavy that around 2337 Moflas have lost their lives, unofficial estimate placed the number of above 10,000 and around 45,400 rebels were captured or they have to surrender, but the toll was in fact even higher or heavier. Uh, we try to see that the Moflas were so completely crushed and demoralized that till independence their participation in any form of politics was almost nil. So, the movement of Mofla uh, is a failure story and uh, much, much of it has to be defeated in terms of the communal thing. Uh, uh, importantly, it is uh, to be seen that Khilafat movement stood for non-violence and also a struggle for independence. So, the Mofla took it to violence and a method of agitation. So, I think on principle they were very different. Uh, and also we try to see that the movement did not have did not motivate the peasantry of the neighborhood to stand in the arm against the landlords uh, because it has a communal angle. So, it was perhaps the lone tragedy of Moflas that their landlords happened to be Hindus and this was never a case in any of the agitation which took place during the 1920s and earlier. So, to conclude we can say that the peasant movement uh, which took place in the 19th and the 20th centuries were part of the wider national struggle. On the one hand, these movements were influenced by the freedom struggle and on the other hand, uh, their impact on the struggle was also important. And we try to see that uh, 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 how the present movement which took place either at the transitional period uh, which ended uh, with the freedom struggle and attainment of the freedom struggle and uh, ultimately we try to see that uh, the analysis of this present movement is going to be quite crucial. Uh, there were several causes of these movements, the major being the increase in the land tax, uh, security of tenure and exploitation of the poor peasantry by the landlords. But the, the big and the middle peasants also participated in the movement and most of the movements leaving aside the Moflas were characterized by the non-violence. However, in the Mofla we try to see that violence was uh, uh, involved and that is how we try to see that there is a sharp decline and uh, the Mofla rebellion has ended completely. So, friends I think uh, this is where we have to learn uh, take a lesson from uh, this particular uh, <coughs> discussion that we had uh, that how Mofla rebellion has uh, taken 
an ugly shape and resulted into the sharp decline. And I think uh, uh, plenty of uh, uh, material is available uh, for further readings. Uh, we can have the contribution by D. N. Dhanagre uh, that is on peasant movement in India that one has to see. And apart from that, uh, we have uh, the contribution by A. R. Desai on agrarian struggle in India after independence uh, uh, that is in 1986, we have to see uh, for further learnings. So, with that friends, uh, we are going to end up this discussions and we will try to have further interaction in the coming future. Thank you for the patience listenings and uh, enjoy your day. Thank you.